very obliging. The next item of business is a motion to approve a draft statutory rule. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That the draft discretionary support amendment number two COVID-19 regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. Thank you. I beg to move. That there should be no time limit on this debate, and I call the minister to open the debate on the motion. The minister. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I suppose, fortunately, these regulations are brought in under Article 135 of the Welfare Reform NI Order 2015. They will amend the discretionary support regulations 2016. As members will be aware, my department recently introduced a number of enhancements to discretionary support scheme. These included the introduction of a new living expenses grant payment to help people who find themselves in crisis situation as a result of COVID-19. I am pleased to advise that my department has moved quickly to introduce this new element of discretionary support. The first living expenses grant for people affected by COVID-19 were made on 25 March. This was a day after the amendment of the regulations were approved. And I want to thank members for moving so quickly to ensure that support could be provided to vulnerable people. I can advise that almost 1,300 living expenses grants for COVID-19 for approximately £219,000 has already been issued. This indicates 175,000 awarded uh, to more than 1,000 households in the week ending the 17th of April. Indeed, in the past month, my department has awarded over £1 million in emergency financial support to more than 5,000 households. I have previously explained that I am determined that my department will do everything it can to help people with, who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 or are advised to self-isolate. This included considering further amendments to discretionary support scheme um, that will be immediate benefit um, and can be introduced quickly. The amendment I am bringing forward today and the discretionary support number two amendment uh, COVID-19 regulations will achieve these aims. This is a relatively straightforward amendment that will immediately allow more people on low incomes, including people or, sorry, subsisting on social security benefits, to access discretionary support. Entitlement to discretionary support is determined by the level of income a person has. This means that people in low paid employment may be eligible to receive support. The amount of income received uh, must be below the annual income threshold, uh, which is a prescribed amount. This uh, income is set, to, is set with the reference of the national minimum wage over 25 rate, and it is automatically adjusted whenever the rate increases. Under the existing legislation, the income threshold increase uh, was £18,137 from the 1st of April this year. However, even with the planned increase, the annual income threshold will be below the level of the benefit cap for couples or people with children, which is currently £20,000. This means that many people, particularly families who have their total benefits reduced by the benefit cap, cannot um, receive help from the discretionary support, and this is unacceptable. I am therefore proposing that the annual income threshold should be increased to more closely align with that level of 20,000. And in the current crisis uh, that we are all facing, this will mean that more people on low incomes will be able to access emergency financial support. This will include new living expenses grant for people affected by COVID-19 that the Assembly recently approved. The new income threshold is considered appropriate as it is the maximum level of benefits that the Department will normally play, uh, pay. Aligning discretionary support to this amount will mean that more people in receipt of income-related benefits will be able to access emergency support. However, I will look to allay concerns that some members may have that uh, we are allowing unrestricted access to grant payments that may be a drain on public sector finances, as some may see. Um, I can provide an assurance that uh, while this amendment will mean that more people will be eligible for discretionary support, that does not mean that they will receive payments. This scheme is there to provide emergency support in a time of crisis for an individual or any member of their immediate family. These conditions must still, therefore, be a payment uh, will be issued. 
The Legislation members are asked to approve today will amend the formula update to calculate the annual income threshold, rather than using the current calculation of 40 hours per week over 52 weeks. The calculation has been changed to 45 hours per week over 52 weeks. I believe this approach is preferable and it will increase the income uh, threshold to £20,405 from 1 April 2020. It will more closely align to the £20,000 benefit cap, cap level while retaining the link with the national minimum wage. The effect of this will be that any future increase in the national minimum wage will automatically result in an increase in the income threshold. The introduction of this amendment to discretionary support alongside changes introduced recently will undoubtedly maximise the emergency financial support available to people on low incomes, and I firmly believe this is the right approach to take at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I call the Chair of the Communities Committee, Ms Paula Bradley, MLA. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I rise to make a few comments on behalf of the committee. Uh, the committee considered the SL1 for these regulations at its meeting of the 6th of April, and the committee were supportive of the regulations being made. The committee is actually scheduled to consider, consider the statutory rule tomorrow, so hasn't had the opportunity to give a formal committee position on the regulations. However, I have contacted the members of the committee, and they have agreed that they are content to support these regulations as long as the minister can give assurances that the policy has not changed since the committee's consideration of the SL1. Notwithstanding that, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, it is worth noting that the committee recognised the necessity to help as many people in need as we possibly can during this crisis. Raising the income threshold to just over 20,000 brings it in line with the benefit cap, which the committee views as a reasonable approach to ensure that more low-income households can access support. Discretionary support has been one of the Department's key mechanisms to provide this support, and the House has seen a, seen a number of regulations directly relating to discretionary support. It is worth reminding the House that a previous set of regulations provided a non-payable grant to successful applicants for short-term living expenses where they or any member of their family has been, has been diagnosed with the condition or been advised to self-isolate, and repeated applications can be made. Given the nature and extent of the crisis, it seems almost impolite to ask about cost, but scrutinising the cost of such proposals, even under the current difficult circumstances, is necessary. The committee did ask about costs relating to the regulations under consideration, but the Department advised us that it did not have reliable estimates for the costs of implementing the regulations. It is, however, logical to state that when you increase the income threshold and therefore widen the eligibility for discretionary support, the cost will go up. But we do not know the number of claims that will be made, and therefore we do not know what their overall cost will be. The committee therefore noted the need to monitor the number of applications for discretionary support so that, where necessary, further bids for funding can be made to the Department of Finance. And can I thank the Minister for her update on some of those figures today? While not directly related to the content of the regulations, it was also reassuring that the Department is redeploying staff to discretionary support and universal credit to ensure that payments are made as quickly as possible to those people in need. The Committee also raised concern about high information about the range of grants and loans under the wider umbrella of discretionary support will be conveyed to applicants to ensure they apply under the scheme most appropriate to their needs. On this issue, the Department agreed to consider how best to disseminate this information to applicants other than NI Direct, and how to make this information as clear and understandable as possible to applicants and MLAs. Perhaps the Minister can advise if progress has, progress has been made on this. Lastly, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, can I pass on the Committee's recognition of the immense amount of work our officials, both on the policy and legislation side, and those on the operational side, have carried out to ensure people are getting the support that they need. I should also add that the staff at the arm's length bodies that come under the remit of the Department we also thank. The Committee wrote to the Minister on this issue last week, but I think it is important we put this on record in the House. 
With that, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the Committee for Communities is content to support the motion that the House approve the regulations. Thank you. Thank you. And before I call the next speaker, can I remind members of the Convention that maiden speeches are heard in this House without interruption? I call Ms. Sinead Ennis. Uh, last time, Corlia, and this is not my maiden speech. <laughs> Oh. I beg your pardon. I was supplied a list by the Speaker's office. You can't get the staff these days. That's desperate. What's, what's the world I apologise. Sorry to disappoint. You'll have to wait oh, a little Well, bit sure. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be, <laughs> it'll be worth. It'll be worth waiting for. Okay. It'll be worth waiting for. I assure you. Um, no, Gormi, I got last time call you and. Uh, I concur with the, the sentiments expressed by the committee chair, uh, and I want to welcome the decision to bring forward this additional enhancement to the discretionary support fund in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the minister is again to be commended on her swift and decisive action and for utilising all means within her department to support people during these very challenging times. Increasing the income threshold for eligibility to the fund uh, to £20,000 will enable more people on low incomes to access this fund if they are experiencing a financial hardship. I would urge uh, the Minister to make sure that the opportunity to apply to the discretionary support fund along with the new criteria is communicated clearly and, repeat and repeatedly for those that need to hear it. And that award decisions can be made quickly to ensure that the financial support can be got to people without delay. I know that the Minister will do her utmost to ensure that this happens, notwithstanding the serious challenges we face in the current environment. I want to commend also the people working within the department in the Jobs and Benefits Office, on the telephone lines and within the independent advice sector, to name a few, who are managing, uh, who are managing the calls from people who find themselves needing, needing advice and support at this very difficult time. It is up to all of us to do what we can and to do it as quickly as we can to help reduce risk to vulnerable people. These are indeed unprecedented times and there is an onus on us all, on this Assembly and particularly on Ministers, to bring forward any and all measures that will support people, particularly vulnerable people, at this time. And with that said, I support the motion. I call Mr Mark Durkin. Thank you uh, very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I'd like to I suppose, be associated with or I'm going to echo the remarks of the Chair and indeed Ms Ennis in, in terms of this. First of all, I, I would welcome this and other uh, moves by the Minister throughout uh, this crisis and, and as we go through it. She, in her remarks, actually the Minister thanked members for allowing this uh, to, to happen so quickly. I'd like to place on record my thanks. Uh, to the Minister for her effort in this regard. She has demonstrated not just great effort, but indeed great empathy. And that's evident in many of the responses, or m many of the aspects of her response to this crisis and her department's uh, response. Uh, the, the points have already been made, uh, as, as they had been by the committee. I think it, it's vital while the Minister has outlined there the, the statistics that demonstrates that there is awareness of this support and accessibility to it. I, I actually think we need to do more to increase awareness of it uh, and ensure that there is signposting towards it when people in desperate circumstances are having all their doors slammed in their face. Uh, the resource issue is a very important one too, and I'm glad that the department are sending troops uh, towards this aspect of the service to ensure that there are sufficient staff uh, there to respond to the demand, but also it's vital that the staff that are deployed there are sufficiently trained and informed so that they are able uh, to, to, to deal with this in an expedient and sensitive fashion that, that, that needs to be dealt with. Uh, it's an extremely difficult time. There are a lot of vulnerable people out there, and this has made them even more uh, vulnerable. There are people who would never have classed or thought of themselves as vulnerable who are now uh, vulnerable. It is important that they know that that support is there and that they are able to get that support as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to thank the Minister for bringing forward the amendment on the discretionary support reg regulations. As the Chair has said, the, the Committee has already agreed that this is something that is important and is needed. 
So many in our society have found themselves in great financial difficulty due to this pandemic. Um, discretionary support, as we know, was set up to help support people who live in Northern Ireland with additional short-term financial support for living expenses. This amendment is very welcome as it is increasing the income level, um, allowing more people access to this discretionary support, and especially those, for instance, couples with children who have been affected by the benefit cap. But I'd also like to say that this now brings um, a much greater number and types of people, as been mentioned by Mark Dirk and Emily, um, into the realms of claiming this support. Um, for instance, the Northern Ireland Ash Bulletin 2019 by NISRA um, states that the type of people that would come into this are skilled tradespeople, plant and machine operatives, administration and secretarial staff, caring, leisure and other service occupations and sales and customer service staff. And as I know, because having been infrastructure spokesperson before, quite a number of people who are self-employed taxi drivers and indeed those who are self-employed within the building trade. So we can expect um, an influx of those people now being able to apply because their average annual earnings will fall into the levels. Um, the only thing that I will say is we're expecting this increase to happen because, as we know, for those self-employed people, the HMRC lines, the online application is not yet open and payments for those people will not be made until at least June. So there are many people across Northern Ireland who never thought that they would be in receipt of benefits are now finding that they have no other option than to apply and to seek that support. So I would ask the Minister to enable joined up working by ensuring those self-employed people now applying for discretionary support or could apply for discretionary support are advised by the economy through NI Business Info um, website that this is available now to them because when you're not used to dealing with benefits you wouldn't even think about going to the Department of Communities website. I want to make sure that those people who have been innovative and who have set up their own businesses um, are not left behind and their families are not left in severe financial hardship because of something that is outside of all of our controls. I'd also like to note that while it's not clearly stated in the legislation, it is on the website that students can now avail of discretionary support, and I'd like to thank the Minister and her department for that. Many students lost the jobs that they needed to help meet their living expenses, and previously benefits were only available to a few students who met an exemption. Exempt exception, sorry. Um, now we're giving access to support at a time when there's little or there's very few options for students to earn income. So what I would ask the Minister is, we know that there will be an influx of people, and as has been mentioned by others, um, the cost of this amendment will be quite large, um, and it's expected to be so because people need help. But I would ask the Minister if she can ensure that these figures um, can be included in the budget that's going to be presented in the future to the committee. I would like to take the opportunity to thank her and her staff. Um, when we talked about this coronavirus, of course health Remember, those people who are providing care, nurses, doctors, and everyone in the health service were being recognised. But we knew that the second wave of people who'd be under pressure would be her staff and the people who are looking after money and the benefits in society. And I have to pay tribute. They have been under an enormous amount of pressure and have dealt with it um, with dignity. And I'd just like to thank them for that. Like others have said, it's important at this stage that we make sure that all those wonderful pieces of help that the Minister is bringing forward are clearly communicated to people so that they know what's available, how to apply and how to ask questions about it. But one thing I would like to know, Minister, this is discretionary support. Can you perhaps explain how you will ensure that your staff are supported to make fair and transparent decisions through this very... Um, difficult period and through a scheme that is going to be very highly um, needed by an awful lot of people here in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and again I welcome the Minister's opening remarks. I by and large concur uh, completely with the remarks of committee members and indeed the Chair has outlined some of our broad outlining concerns. We are all acutely aware of the dangers of this virus and indeed the extreme nature of its transmission. And in these times, I want to salute our emergency services and who continue to play a, a, a vital role in, in reducing the risk to the citizens across this country. I also want to put on record my thanks and appreciation to the many um, Department of Community staff um, who are playing such a crucial role at this time, and also extend that to the many other key workers, and in particular those council uh, workers who are continuing to carry out essential services. I think in partic particular in the Department of Communities to the many dedicated workers, as has been outlined 
in our jobs and benefits offices across Northern Ireland. Today they face their biggest challenge to date, dealing with the many worried and anxious workers who fear for their families' safety in these uh, grave uh, times of economic hardship. The need for urgent support and guidance now, but equally when this period of destruction is over, and it will end, our community, uh, and the, in relation to the, our community will need this department more than ever before. Uh, I, I read recently with, with some alarm that a local ec economist uh, was estimating that a potential 132,000 jobs could be lost as a result of COVID-19 here in Northern Ireland. Those people, we may not see that coming through now, but, but come a time the pressure on the department, and in particular those members of staff, will be quite considerable. And it's up to us here as a committee to support them, and I know the Minister will continue to do that in her, in her role. I would also like to pay tribute to those, uh, not within the, the broad remit of the Department of Communities, that have provided food for us all. We know that the department has carried out schemes in relation to um, essential uh, non-perishable goods to people, but there's also many within the community, from our farmers to those who are in delivery and transport, to the food production, factory workers, and indeed all of those in food retail. From the farmer to the truck driver, we are forever thankful for your work in these hard times. Our communities are indebted to these people, and I would ask that we continue to show them patience and understanding throughout this period. Frontline essential workers are, the most, are facing the most insurmountable pressure and it's crucial that we support them as best we can. Mr Speaker, I support the discretionary support regulations brought forward by the Minister to the House today, in albeit but far from ideal circumstances, as was outlined by the Committee Chair. As a member of the Communities Committee, I have been afforded little to no opportunity, along with other members, to scrutinise the regulations before the House. I know this is in times that we live in, and I do welcome that Speed is an, an essential asset in relation to getting that targeted help to those that are mo most in need, uh, are need. But something that I must say and state, this goes against my very grain as an elected representative to be operating in such a fashion. But I am uh, relieved of the fact that this Assembly can still meet. We can still put these questions to the Minister and indeed help improve the situation that we face. That said, and as I mentioned before, I am on record at the committee as stating my desire to work alongside the Minister in these deeply uncertain times. Extraordinary times calls for extraordinary measures. For that cooperation to happen, and this has been mentioned in some of the key concerns by the committee, I would urge the Minister to continue and her department to continue in that engagement with the committee ongoing. And I, I do welcome the fact of the conference call that we, we had with the minister and her department officials. I find that particularly useful for us as uh, members to, to feed into the process the key concerns that we had. And many of these key concerns have been addressed in, in what the minister uh, has brought forward. And I know uh, that members will continue to put them on record. In essence, these amendments are to be welcomed for all those that are eligible. Uh, it will go some way in easing the fears uh, and concerns that vulnerable people in our communities are facing at this time. However, I do have a number of questions uh, that, uh, on the back of these reg uh, regulations, which I trust the Minister can potentially uh, address. Some have already been alluded to. One, namely, and again, as the Chair's sentiments uh, stated, mentioning cost is not something that we, we, we do. Um, easy in these times. We understand that a lot of people uh, need support and need it now, but it would, it would be wrong for us as members to not think of the economic impact of the measures brought forward. Uh, so the cost, I, I recognise what the Minister has said, and I, I, I would urge her to keep this under constant review, uh, because as we have um, widened the net, per se, with these discretionary payments, we are uncertain, and indeed the Department is uncertain, as to the totality of their costs. I would also like to put uh, on record the, um, my concern regarding the administration of support and the pressure on staff. Uh, could the Minister maybe outline to the members how indeed this uh, discretion payment can be um, applied in the most appropriate and swift manner, uh, where department uh, officials, maybe from other, where, other places within the department, can be directed to help, because we are expected a huge influx of people applying for this uh, payment. My thoughts are, are primarily, primarily with those that have lost loved ones at this time, and I can't begin to even imagine the pain 
that they've been going through, as has been mentioned, uh, being denied such basic functions of life. In the past two weeks, and I know the Minister will have recognised too, I've been moved uh, by the, the charitable nature manifesting in our local communities, uh, neighbours, sports clubs and various organisations that fall under the Minister's remit. The, these are organisations which the Minister will have to give considerable attention to as this crisis unfolds. And I recognise in many of these cases there has been some movement in relation to some of the payments that have, have, have been provided. But to enable this, we must explore how we, we we reach those that essentially are not being reached. And I, I want to make mention of two. Uh, the community COVID fund that the Minister released in the grant, while I welcome that, and I think it's a, an essential tool at this time to give community groups the ability to access funding um, to help those in need in their communities. But the Minister will recognise, and indeed I know other members in the House will, will that over the course of COVID-19, we have seen a massive influx of those that have been involved in community activism. They're not joining the uh, normal community groups that are already constituted in place. They have set up their own groups, which are much more targeted and, effect and essentially, in some cases, effect uh, much more effective at reaching those that are essentially not in the remit or grasp of the constituted community groups. They have been unable to access that grant funding because they aren't a constituted community group um, and they don't have a bank account per se in that regard. I would ask the Minister to perhaps look at ways in which we can reach those specifically organisations that have set up with COVID-19 specifically in mind, because if we can reach them and in turn they can reach their community, I think we can uh, lessen the impact that many are facing at this time. I also want to allude to charities. Many face the devastating loss of income at this time. Um, I, I think of particularly the good work that's going on with a lot of charities in our communities. And I, I take in my own constituency of the YMCA in Portadown, who have led from the front to bring in and collect goods and perishable goods, non-perishable and perishable goods, to deliver and distribute to the community. Has the Minister given any consideration to a form of hardship grant that can help alleviate the pressures that they're facing at this time? They're still providing a valuable service, and I think, as we discussed discretionary support, we are, in, we are indeed quite rightly targeting those that we know are vulnerable, but there is also others out there that are particularly vulnerable at this time who perhaps don't fall under the specific discretionary support, as has mentioned, but it's, nonetheless it is important that we as members raise them with the Minister, and perhaps we can look at a broader remit in terms of support package. That being said, I support the regulations. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, no doubt everybody will, will support this move um, today, but I can't help but point out that it, uh, it isn't far enough and to draw attention to how uh, the Executive, uh, in my view, is dragging its heels in terms of announcing serious measures and wide ranging measures to help the unemployed, uh, those with benefits, and those most vulnerable in our society across Europe, indeed, even across the water and south of the border, where we are governed by dangerous Tories in Britain and practically Irish Tories in Fine Gael. We have seen governments forced to take measures that are out of step with their economic uh, thinking to support workers and the unemployed. But little to no independent thinking uh, or action from the, uh, from the executive, seemingly. Uh, this crisis has seen thousands of unemployed people joining the queue for universal credit. And I must say, Mr Deputy Speaker, I do wonder if the parties in this room who voted through uh, universal credit, and I regret their support uh, for uh, welfare reform, as thousands of people of their constituents and mine turn to food banks and community uh, food parcels for support. Uh, moving back to this legislation, this legislation was obviously due to uh, come up a few weeks ago. Uh, the Minister obviously removed it from the agenda. We are now back with it, uh, from what I can tell, without uh, wide-ranging changes uh, to it, uh, or changes that aren't um, uh, good enough, in my view, um, because the, re the reality is that the real obstacle for people uh, accessing discretionary support are issues like the amount of debt they have, whether they can claim it when they first apply for universal credit. Discretionary support is very restrictive, and it seems to me that the increase in income thresholds will extend to those workers who have been uh, furloughed, but I cannot see who else it will benefit, such as those trying to survey this crisis on meagre universal credit payments. And while I welcome the fact 
that those who are self-isolating can now access a grant three times in a 12-month period. This does not go far enough, in my view. There needs to be a greater uh, emphasis, greater moves to pay the unemployed, increase universal credit, increase housing benefit, as well as scrapping the benefit cap and other draconian uh, measures. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to highlight uh, to the Minister the issues of loans uh, and the fact that because they are deducted from benefit payments, uh, some people find themselves crippled between discretionary support loan repayments and other uh, repayments. Debt repayments should immediately be cancelled for people struggling in this context in this current environment. Uh, so finally, I would like to ask the Minister, uh, can she tell the House what is the breakdown of grants versus loans that have been awarded by her department since this crisis began some weeks ago? Thank you. Thank you. I call the Minister for Communities to wind on the debate. Yeah, thanks very much. There's a couple of issues um, obviously have been picked up, which are all uh, important issues. And obviously the first thing with the finance, I've covered this a couple of times in committee and then obviously during the ministerial statement uh, a couple of weeks ago. And obviously there was an underspend initially in contingency uh, fund arrangements that we had within the department. That with a bid that we have also made to the Department of Finance for this financial year, £5 million. Um, at this point, we are confident that we can meet the need that is there. Um, obviously, there are mechanisms that are put in place. This is a discretionary grant, um, and it will be monitored on a regular basis uh, by our staff. I do a weekly uh, meeting with the staff within the social security system just to ensure that everything around staff resources around making sure that we're protecting those most in need, um, making sure that the system is functioning. So this is kept under um, constant review. Um, and I suppose I'll just echo the words of those um, in the chamber that have really thanked the staff. Um, we have one of them here, not to redden his face, um, but David, um, amongst others, uh, people who have really went above and beyond and, and who normally do in fairness um, because they really believe um, in meeting the needs of people at the grassroots. So I just want to reiterate um, those words. Um, of our essential frontline staff that are delivering these essential frontline services. And I do think the public um, have seen that, and particularly those that are availing of this support um, have seen that uh, as well. I suppose in terms of the process itself, discretionary support is a manual system, and that's one of the difficulties, is that it has to be physically put in on a manual basis, and that in some ways slows it up. We have redirected staff within the department, and again, I've um, touched on this a couple of times at committee and indeed in this chamber previously. So we have come away from other duties um, around collecting um, other payments and stuff, and we've redirected people, particularly into universal credit, because of the massive influx of over 50,000 new applications. And then we've also redirected people into discretionary support as well. We've broken down the processes that are needed, so not everybody needs to have the full training in discretionary support, so we've broken down how the process is managed to ensure that we're speeding up those processing times. And there's now um, also an online application that people can then fill in the application online and can return that application online as well. So all of these new changes that have been introduced over the last couple of weeks, and indeed that online application form um, is now available on uh, NI Direct as well. Um, I suppose just to go back to the finance, and I know the issue around uh, those who were in employment or maybe were self-employed, obviously they can't avail of this. I'll look into in terms of the communications issue more broadly, but particularly those who maybe haven't interfaced with the social security system before. Um, I'll look and see what we can do around ensuring that people in that business community um, also have the relevant information um, that where they now have to engage. And I suppose, I mean, we have seen, uh, I suppose, social security measures introduced to the business community as well, of up to 400 million um, in support so far. So when you look at a million pounds um, in financial support, um, I think it just has to be taken in that wider context. And I think we are uh, putting the money here through discretionary support at those at the bottom end, at the coal face, um, who really need it the most. So if we can de-risk or give social security protections to business, then certainly we can do it uh, for those most vulnerable and those who do need it the most. 
Um, it was touched on again and again, I read this in the Assembly a couple of weeks ago, that yes, students can avail of this, and that's because I have declared this um, an emergency, and therefore that allows students um, to be in. And again, from that meeting, I asked that for that to be communicated to the unions um, over the last couple of weeks as well. The criteria itself uh, for this part in terms of the COVID obviously is for those in crisis. And I think that's important that it's not just a one-off grant. You can apply for this grant. It's not limited to three times. You can apply for this grant more than once um, and on multiple times if you are in crisis and you're displaying that you're in crisis and that you do need that help and support. There is also regular contact with the independent advice sector. Um, there are weekly engagements with them. And indeed, because they know, obviously, we don't want anyone not having the information into this support. We're trying to get that information out there as much as possible. And obviously, through our own jobs and benefits works that we're doing, but importantly, working with the independent advice sector to ensure that we get that out. And again, I have to commend the work of them. I mean, the COVID community helpline, for example, um, is being managed by Advice NI with many of those independent advice organisations as well, who are, again, going above and beyond their normal duties to really respond to this health emergency that we all uh, find ourselves in. I know the issue then of those who have come on to the social security system and where they go to next, what is the unfolding situation going to come, and indeed staff within our social security team as well as responding to this direct emergency and trying to deal with people in the here and now. They have already started plans in place to look at the interim next steps, what we need to do beyond that, and importantly, trying to get people back out into uh, the job market for those particularly that can move quickly enough as well. So, again, we will continue to update the committee um, on those uh, next steps um, and this chamber as well as we start to move through that. Um, I'm committed, obviously, to come back to the committee again and having that engagement with the committee. Um, I meet with Paula or speak to her on the phone um, on a weekly basis in terms of the chair. And we spoke yesterday. And obviously, I am keen that any written questions that come in from the committee that they are responded to um, as quickly as possible, because it is a fast-changing situation. And I do see the importance of updating the committee and members of this chamber uh, to that. The issue of the community and voluntary sector obviously is an important one as somebody who is a community activist herself. I see that. We are obviously have established the uh, community and voluntary sector emergencies leadership group. That includes regional organisations like NICFA, but it also includes, includes those organisations at the grassroots like neighbourhood renewal areas. I know that there has been work done and they're going to be looking at that around how we can support the sector as we move through this crisis and we move out at the other end. And indeed, we're looking at that. Um, but I did move quickly um, in March to ensure that we paid their grants up front to ensure that um, all that I could do, the economic levers that I have within my department, that we were making it easier for people in terms of availing of those grants to ensure that cash flow um, could continue. But there's no doubt there will be a job of work beyond this. Uh, the issue then of unconstituted groups, I'll look at that in terms of seeing what we can do. I know that uh, the money, uh, the COVID community support fund primarily has went through the local council. So maybe if there's any flexibilities um, that can be looked at there, maybe if it's not financial transactions, it may be some of the services or the resources that they could work with those groups understanding those safeguarding, protecting and safeguarding procedures obviously will still have to be in place. Um, but the, the amount of act activism has been unbelievable. Not surprising, but it has been unbelievable. Um, from church groups um, to uh, Gaelic clubs, rugby clubs, football teams, um, just residents living in a street, getting together and really starting to look after one another has been really good. Um, and I imagine and hope that that will continue beyond this crisis. So how we support that type of activism at the grassroots will be important, and particularly as we develop our strategies around anti-poverty, um, around tackling inequality. Um, we want to rely on those people in terms of working with us um, in the time ahead as well. So we will be looking at that. I obviously did work with the DERA Minister around the initial funding that we put through CFNI. There was a restriction on religious groups, for example, that could apply to that fund because CFNI don't fund uh, religious organisations. So we have tried to look at flexibilities that we can build in. I know DERA put uh, funding towards that, and particularly in rural communities. Um, and it's something that we're continuing to try and 
work on um, as we're moving through. Yeah, of course. I, th I thank the Minister for giving way, and, and I welcome her desire within the Department to look at some element of flexibility. Perhaps could I suggest potential room for flexibility within that scheme would be, at the moment, yes, you're right, administered through councils, constituted community groups are the only people that can access the funding. Now, they can work in conjunction with another group, but sometimes uh, that is where the, the barriers start to, to come up because uh, they, they're not always connected to the same. They're not always, they maybe have a different remit or a different focus. Potentially, a, a way in which this could be accessed is through some businesses, for example. And I think of my own constituency where rural businesses have worked alongside some of these groups to deliver groceries, to deliver essentials. They potentially could access this funding and use the community albeit not a constituted group, to actually get involved in delivery of these goods. That, that's the type of creative thinking that I, I would like to see come from the department. Yeah, no problem, and we're willing to look at all options. I mean, the important thing is, is that the resource and the need is met at the grassroots, um, and obviously that will be different solutions in different areas, depending on what um, the local need is. And obviously that will be the importance of working with councils and working with those organisations and individuals then at the grassroots to ensure that we are uh, meeting that need. So I'm, I'm more than happy to look at all of those issues in the time ahead. The issue of charities, um, I know it's not directly related to discretionary support, but I thought I'll just answer it. Obviously, there is additional monies that will be coming in. Uh, we're in discussions with finance and obviously with my own officials around how we best support charities during this period. Um, and particularly, I know there will be an attention around the, the hospices as well. So those obviously who have end of life um, current responsibilities, it's an extremely sensitive issue. Um, and I know that those discussions, I'm hopeful that there will be a conclusion to those um, as soon as possible, and then that will be released. The other issues then in terms of broader welfare reform changes, I mean, it's been rehearsed. Um, I'm not a supporter. Um, we could get into a broader political debate in terms of the constitutional issues on this island. The fact that we are in power sharing arrangements, the fact that we get a block grant, we don't have our own fiscal levers. Um, I don't think it's helpful to get into all of those issues uh, today. My remit in bringing this forward is to do all that I can to protect the most vulnerable. I come from a working class community. I'm acutely aware um, of what the issues are within those communities. I do want to bring more changes in terms of looking at these issues, not just in the midst of this crisis, but looking at this more broadly. And I know even when we're talking about discretionary support, whilst we're looking at the issue of COVID-19 now, there is an ongoing review of discretionary support within the department, and I will be bringing forward broader changes to reflect that um, in the time ahead. And as I say, and I'll say it again to the members, if people have suggestions, if people have ideas, my door is always open. You don't have to wait until you're in the chamber um, to come up and make a point that you can always come and speak to me, and I'm more than willing to sit with anyone to look, because if there's an unmet need and we can change the system to respond to that, then I'm more than willing to engage with anyone in, in meeting that need in the time ahead. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the draft discretionary support amendment number two, COVID-19 regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Business committee is arranged to meet at 1 p.m. today. I propose, therefore, by leave of the assembly, to suspend this sitting until 2 p.m. First item of business when we return will be a motion on accelerated passage for the private tenancies coronavirus modifications.